Genesis 1.1 In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning. Today's lesson is entitled, Always the Plan. Always the Plan, Part 1 specifically. This is Pastor Scott Conway at QX Church. We're not even out of Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. And created he man in his own image. So in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and created man in his own image. We're in Genesis 1. And the plan is already made. We're in Genesis 1. The plan is already in motion. Man is made. And he is given the most powerful and the most dangerous of gifts, free will. What makes free will such a dangerous gift is people can do bad things with free will. When you have free will, you have the option to choose to do the right thing, which is credit to you as a virtue. But you also have the power to choose the wrong thing. Now, so long as the right thing is something you want to do, well, free will's not a problem. Free will becomes a problem when the thing you want to do is precisely the thing you should not do. Free will becomes a problem when the thing that you want to do, the emotional impulse you have, the emotional drive, the logical justification, the rationalizations are all driving you in a direction other than something good, something right. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and created man in his own image and placed upon man free will. That means Adam could choose Adam could look at an apple and an orange and he could decide for himself which one he wanted. He could pick. He could choose. But so long as every option you have is good, it's not much of a free will choice. For free will to really have meaning, there has to be the ability to choose something other than what's good. For free will to have a meaning, you have to be able to choose a wrong answer. If I'm a teacher and I give my kids a test, and I ask them the question, one plus one equals, and they have to circle an answer, and the answer number one is two. They can circle B, which is 2. They can circle C, which is 2. They can circle D, which is 2. And all of the questions are like this. Are you going to look at the kids at the end of the test and go, Boy, what smart kids. Look at that. They got every single answer correct. There is no wrong answer. For free will to have meaning, for someone's character to have meaning, for virtue to have meaning, there has to at least exist the possibility of choosing a wrong answer. So in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. You can have apples, you can have oranges, you can have pears. You can have anything you want, except. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat it, you shall surely die. The instruction was given to Adam. Now there's a choice. Obey or disobey. Do the right thing. Do any of the right things. Do all of the right things. 
Every choice you could make is a right choice. There's only one wrong answer. It's like now he's been given a test. What am I allowed to eat in the garden? And there's a list of a hundred things. And all of them are right answers. Except for one. And that one thing is the only wrong answer. And to get it wrong, to be disobedient, he has to skip the 99 he's allowed and go for the one that he isn't. God had made obedience so easy. You have an incredible variety of right answers. You have an incredible variety of options, any one of which is totally okay, even, even good. Only one is bad. Only one is disobedient. And not only did he say, don't eat it because I said so. I'm your father and I said so. He laid out a consequence. You shall surely die. That's fatal. Now there's a number of theories about this, going from immortal to mortal because of the eating. The separation of the soul from the body. That the body suddenly becomes this temporal thing instead of being sustained by an immortal soul. Obviously it wasn't immediate physical death. We know that. But whatever this lesson really means, God impresses upon Adam that this is serious stuff. I'm giving you a choice. It's important to God that Adam have a meaningful choice. It's important that for him to have credit for obedience, disobedience must be possible. But it's easy. Free will has meaning now. Now it's no longer choosing between one good okay thing and another good okay thing. Now there's a wrong choice, and Adam is told to not make it. Why is free will so important? Why was it so important to God to set up this opportunity for free will when he knows Free will gives mankind the opportunity to disobey. He even gives them one way, one way to disobey. And he already knows Adam's going to take it. He already knows the future is not a surprise to God. And there's going to be a price to pay for that. Not just for Adam, but for God. It's not just Adam who's going to die. It's God who is going to die. And he decides to do it anyway. I believe it's because of love. You can't have a relationship if there's no choice. You cannot experience love from someone who has no choice but to love you. You can't program your computer to say all the right things. They go, oh, how sweet my computer loves me. <coughs> all it's doing is doing what you programmed it to do. It's not doing it out of respect. It's not doing it out of a decision to obey. It's not building a relationship with you because it likes you. It's doing as it's programmed. It, it doesn't have choice. It doesn't decide to come to you. It doesn't decide 
to respond to you, to reciprocate. It's just programmed. And God wanted man to be able to have this relationship, to have this choice, to have an eternal relationship with God. And by the design of creation, Adam could have had that in the garden. By the repercussions of free will, that game was going to have to change, and God was going to be the one who was going to have to change it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 22. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man. Now note, Eve is made, and that woman is the only 2.0 of creation. As far as we know from the, the narrative, she is the only living thing in creation not made from dust. Now, if that doesn't give her an elevated status, I don't know what does. Obviously, she's not a copy of Adam. She's different. Now, they're male and female. One of the jokes, so God made Adam, took a look at Adam, said, oh, that's not good for this guy to be by himself. I can do better than that. And that he took the rib from Adam's side and made human 2.0, the woman. Says, ah, that's more like it. Brings the woman to Adam. And Adam looks like a whoa, man. Now, certainly, a lot of men probably agree with the fact that, that women can be pretty amazing. And knowing a lot of women who really love their men, I know a lot of women who say, yeah, and men are pretty spectacular too. That men and women were made to be in partnership. Now note that Adam knew the rule. God told the man. So who tells Eve? Well, presumably, Adam is the one that told Eve. Sort of. Genesis chapter 3. This is where the plan starts to fall apart. Because the serpent is in the garden and the serpent contacts Eve. Now Eve's understanding of the plan, her understanding of the command, her understanding of the one rule isn't don't eat from the tree as she expresses it, and presumably with a 2.0 brain, fashioned personally by God, she can actually remember these things. She says that we can't eat from the tree or even touch it. Now there is a Hebrew legend that says, that, so the serpent walks up to the tree, looks at really, you can't touch it, and he touches the tree. Seems like I'm fine. Clearly, God's lying to you. Another legend is that he grabbed Eve and shoved her against the tree. So, ah, now you've touched it. And you see nothing happened. God's a liar. However, the temptation came about. It says, Eve was wholly deceived. When she did what she did, she had been tricked possibly set up by Adam. Possibly set up because if Adam is the one who told her you can't even touch the tree, bad stuff happens if you even touch the tree. And then either she's made to touch the tree or the serpent touches the tree and nothing bad happens. Then she's thinking, well, quite logically, nothing bad happens when you touch or eat from the tree even though the bad thing wasn't going to happen until the eating. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, second half. 
she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. We're told elsewhere in scripture that Eve was deceived, Adam was disobedient. She did what she did because she was tricked. He did what he did knowingly. He knew what the rule was. And based upon this phrase that we translate with her, the implication is that he's right nearby. He's right there. She didn't have to go find her husband to share the fruit. She just had to hand it to him because he's there. Eve was deceived. Adam was the one told by God to not eat, and he ate. Now we see the need for the plan. They've eaten. We have to have a plan. Now, God's not surprised by any of this. Now, the angels may have been surprised as they're kind of watching this whole thing unfold, going, um, okay, Lord, we've been kind of watching you do this thing, and we're watching you create the heavens and the earth, and we're, we're watching all this stuff unfold, and, and yet, yeah, that, that garden, Lord, masterpiece, beautiful work of art. Man, pretty amazing thing you got going on there. Deciding all the names of the animals, all of that fruit, oh my gosh, that looks spectacular. Give my a hundred ways to obey, only one way to disobey. Yeah, I mean, you got it set up. You got it go. Oh, a woman, man. Human 2.0. Awesome invention. Got to say God, doing good work. And then, oh wait, Lord. They blew it already. How, how did they blow it already? There's only two of them. You made their brains by hand. How could they do this? It's not like they could forget. I'm not saying it's okay. I've got a plan. What's the plan? <coughs> well, for one part of the plan, and we're still in Genesis chapter 3. We haven't even left Genesis yet. The serpent is informed what the plan is. As, as God informs the serpent... And I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed. So in some way, shape, or form, the woman plays the big part of this plan. And between your seed and her seed. Not the man's seed. In language, the seed comes from the man. But it's not the man's seed, it's the woman's seed. And whoever this woman and her seed is, the seed, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. The idea being expressed... And in the third chapter of Genesis, this is as far as we've gotten, and we already know there's going to be a conflict. There's a contest going on here. There's a battle, even a war. And the way it's going to play out is the enemy's going to get his shot. Going to get the heel. Going to do some damage. Just not much. And he's going to get defeated. That's the bruise on the head. The plan is announced. The enemy of the serpent shall be the seed of the woman. An odd structure. The seed of the woman. The implication being in some way, shape, or form, the woman is going to have a son apart from a man being part of that equation. Now, the beginning parts of the seed of the man with the woman having children in a very conventional way doesn't really go all that well. Cain and Abel don't really get along. 
Cain murders Abel. Cain gets kicked out. Things are looking pretty bad. So if the seed of the woman is supposed to start off being the biological children of Adam and Eve, doesn't really seem to be working out so well. One of them's dead already. The other one seems to be siding with the serpent. Whatever the enmity is between the serpent and the woman and her seed and his seed doesn't really seem to be working out so well, if that's what it's supposed to mean. But now we're in chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. Adam begat Seth. It says, we have been appointed a son to replace Abel, whom Cain has killed. The name Seth means appointed. And Seth begat Enosh. The story is starting to be told. Adam, Adam means man. <clears throat> Seth means appointed. The name of Seth's son Enosh means mortal. Man is appointed mortal. The story is beginning to unfold one word at a time. Preserved for us in Genesis. We haven't even left Genesis. We can count the chapters on one hand, and the story is beginning to unfold. The story that's beginning to unfold is that God created the heavens and the earth. God made man. God gave Adam a choice, and Adam chose poorly. And that God has a plan. And that God's plan involves the seed of the woman. And there's going to be some contest going on between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And the seed of the woman is going to win. It's already seeming like whatever this plan is, is pretty bizarre. But there's a plan. Three generations in, and we're still in Genesis chapter 4. We haven't even gotten to the fifth chapter yet. The story is beginning to unfold that man is appointed mortal. That this is in some way an appointment by God. And, in fact, I believe a blessing from God. Because once man fell, once that choice was made, now there's a price to be paid for sin. Now there's a good and a bad, and there's more bad to be chosen. And right from the beginning, Adam chose bad, Next from the beginning, Cain chose bad, really bad. I mean, think about this. You got three men on the planet. One of them already chose to break the only rule God gave. Of the next two, one of them chooses to murder the other one. Adam was warned, don't do it, you'll die. A generation later, we have murder and someone's physically dying. The first physical death we have recorded is Abel being murdered. Mankind's not really off to a good start. And if you're off to this bad a start and you have immortality, you could spend eternity in payment for all of this. You could spend eternity in eternal consequences for every choice ever made. You could spend eternity living with every scar you ever collected. Everything that healed back poorly. Everything that ever went wrong in your body, carried with you for life. You could be stuck with this forever. So mortality might be a bit of a blessing. Physical mortality might be a bit of a blessing. So that our eternity is not based upon our physical body. 
Then we get to Genesis chapter 5. Enosh begat Canaan. Canaan means sorrow. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. There's mortality and sorrow, and the sorrow is mortal. The sorrow can and ultimately will kill us. Canaan begat Mahalalel. Oh, I love that name, Mahalalel. Besides the fact it took me some practice time to pronounce all of the syllables in there. But the name Mahalalel means gracious God. God is gracious. The grace of God. Mahalalel. Mahalalel names his son Jared. So Jared is next. And Jared is a name that means shall come down. You know, well, wait a minute. We, we, we have this story that's continuing to add on to word by word. Man appointed mortal sorrow. Gracious God shall come down? Really? That's getting kind of interesting. Gracious God comes down. What, what, what's he coming down for? Is he coming down to bring judgment? Is he coming down to tell the whole world, that's it, game up, time to pay the price? Jared names his son Enoch. Enoch walked with God. In fact, we're told Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. That at some point in time, after 300, 350 years of walking with God, drawing closer to God, at one point Enoch's walking with God and God says, you know, you're closer over here than you are over there. Just come chill with me. And Enoch just heads off with God. Enoch had the special personal relationship with God and his name meant teacher. And Enoch walked with God and was not. Adam is still alive. Seth is still alive. All of them are still alive. Enoch's the first one to go. He walked with God and was not. He was the one who left before Adam died. The one whose name means teacher. The story is unfolding through Enoch. And we're just in chapter 5 of the entire Bible, and we're beginning to see the story. The story is unfolding before our eyes. The whole plan is being laid out for us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God made man in his image. God gave man the ability to choose, so there's a meaningful choice between obey or disobey, which makes love and relationship even possible. Man blows it. And somehow the solution in here is going to be the seed of the woman and the story being told. The man's appointed mortal sorrow. Yep, see that already happening. Adam and Eve lost the blessing of the garden. They lost the blessing of eternal life in the form that they were originally in. Cain Murder is Abel. They've lost one of their sons to death. The other son's been kicked out. He's out there. Already a murderer. Nothing stopping him from coming back. Nothing from stopping him from coming back for Seth or anybody else. God even put a mark on Cain to protect him. No one was even allowed to touch him. Adam isn't even allowed to go after Cain to protect his kids, his grandkids. It's not allowed. And we have this story unfolding. Man appointed, mortal, suffer, gracious God shall come down teaching. It's not coming down for judgment. He's not coming down for punishment. 
He's not coming down with his wrath. It says, God, showing up in his grace, his power exerted for our benefit. That's what grace is. Mercy is you deserve bad things, you're not going to get it. So, to the extent God is merciful, what that means is there's bad stuff we deserve, and we don't get all the bad that we actually do deserve. There's gracious God. Gracious God says there's good stuff you don't deserve. You don't deserve this good stuff. But grace is I'm going to show up and give you the good stuff. The good stuff. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it through your own worthiness, through your own value production. You're being overpaid here. That's grace. So gracious God, the God is giving you stuff you didn't have to pay for yourself, is going to come down teaching. He'll be teaching. He tried to teach Adam. Adam had one lesson to remember. Don't eat from that tree. You know he remembered the lesson. He had a brain designed by God in person. Broke the rule. But somewhere along the lines is the gracious God will come down teaching. The one named teacher, the one who walked with God, the one, that one, named his son Methuselah. Now Methuselah is an interesting name. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Now, a couple of curious things about Methuselah. His name means his death shall bring. The one who walked with God named his son his death shall bring. Methuselah would go on to live longer than any man, and when Methuselah died, the flood came. You can actually sit down with your Bible, pull out all of the begats, who lived how long and gave birth to who, and you run the numbers from the birth of Methuselah to the flood. From the birth of Methuselah to the flood is, I believe, 969 years. The age of Methuselah, 969 years. Seems Enoch knew something. Enoch knew this kid, my kid, when he dies, his death shall bring the flood. His death shall bring the end of humankind 1.0. The beta test isn't going to go so well. We're going to have to start over. And it's interesting. It really is like Enoch knew. Methuselah's death and the flood come at the same time. But we still have the sentence unfolding. Methuselah has a son. Methuselah begat Jared. The name Jared means afflicted. And Methuselah's grandson, Jared's kid, is Noah. And the name Noah means comfort. So the story is revealed. The whole plan is now laid out for us. And it's not even laid out for us once, it's laid out for us twice, just in case we miss it the first time. The story is told twice in the genealogy. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. But gracious God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the afflicted comfort. Oh, that's a powerful story. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. Yep, we see that happening. We've seen murder. We've seen death. But gracious God, the God who will give good things we don't have to earn for ourselves, will come down teaching and what will he be teaching? He'll be teaching that his death shall bring 
the afflicted comfort. God's death will bring the afflicted comfort? How, how will that happen? Did God just say he would literally lay down his own life? For his creation. But we know man is appointed mortal sorrow. We know man is afflicted. We haven't even gotten past the fifth chapter of Genesis. He's already telling us what his plan is. His plan is he will come down teaching us that in some way, shape, or form, his death shall be our comfort. Sounds an awful lot like the gospel message. Unless we fail to recognize the story as the gospel, it's told a second time, in a different way, through the order of death. Now, for the most part, they died in the order they were born in. There's a couple of exceptions. We already mentioned that Enoch, who walked with God and was not, for God took him. That was before Adam died. So Enoch goes before Adam. And we talked about Methuselah, and Methuselah dies when the flood comes. Well, what happened to Methuselah's son, Jared? The, the man between Methuselah and Noah. Well, Jared dies before his father dies. So we put Enoch in the front of the sentence and we take Jared and we put Jared in front of Methuselah and that makes a new story, a new sequence that tells a different aspect of the same story. Now the story reads, the teacher of man is appointed mortal sorrow. Gracious God shall come down and be afflicted. His death shall bring comfort. So first we're told man is appointed mortal sorrow. But gracious God shall come down teaching. What's he teaching? That his death shall bring the afflicted comfort. And now we're told the teacher of man is appointed mortal sorrow. Go, whoa, hang on a minute. Who's the teacher of man? We, we were just told, gracious God shall come down teaching. The teacher of man is gracious God who shall come down teaching. And now it says the teacher of man is appointed mortal sorrow. How... How can the teacher of man be appointed mortality? How can the teacher of man be appointed mortality with sorrow? How can the teacher of man be appointed a sorrow that will literally kill him? This is the gracious God. But in some way, shape, or form, it says the gracious God shall come down teaching and the gracious God is appointed mortal sorrow. But what was he teaching? He was teaching that his death shall bring the afflicted comfort. Now it says now, we took teacher out, because teacher's in front now. Enoch before Adam, the teacher of man, is appointed mortal sorrow. The gracious God shall come down. Methuselah dies after Jared. The gracious God shall come down and be afflicted. He is going to be among the afflicted. Methuselah and then Noah. Methuselah, his death shall bring Noah comfort. His death shall bring comfort. The death of God will bring comfort. There's a plan. God has a plan. And it's been revealed. And we've only gotten as far as Genesis chapter.
chapter 5. And the whole plan is laid out. We can count the chapters on one hand. And we already have the whole plan laid out. The seed of the woman. God shall come down and teach and be afflicted. And his death shall bring comfort. Five chapters in. We haven't even gotten to Noah's Ark yet. And there's already a plan. Five chapters in. God knew there would have to be a plan because of free will and he gave free will anyway. He already knew that free will to man would mean that he himself would have to come down. He himself would have to be afflicted. He himself would have to die to fix this. And he still gave free will. He still craved that ability to have a real relationship enough that he was willing to die for this relationship. That he was willing to let his own creation disobey him. To give them the opportunity to obey. That he was willing to lose what he loved. To have a relationship out of love. And he was willing to be the one to pay the price himself to make that relationship possible again. We haven't even gotten half a dozen chapters into the Bible and the need for the plan and the plan itself is already revealed. If you are into prophecy, There's a theory called the scarlet thread. And the idea of the scarlet thread is there is some prophecy, some hint of the coming Messiah. Some reference that can be interpreted as pointing to Jesus Christ. Either in an example, in an illusion, in a pattern, in a type, or just in a flat out prophecy. That's pointing at Jesus Christ. Certainly, if you want to go to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and look at all of the places it tells us it was fulfilled that. And then it quotes Old Testament Scripture. Again, and again, and again, and again. The wise men, they come to Jerusalem, they want to know where is the one born king of the Jews, and they, they go look it up in the prophecies. So, well, according to the prophecies, that would be Bethlehem. Long before Jesus was born, so much of that story was told. That was told clearly five chapters in the Genesis. The story was already told. God told the story before it happened. Not just in the prophecies over the course of of hundreds and thousands of years, but right at the beginning. Right at the beginning, the story is recorded for us. And the root word meanings of the Hebrew names of the lineage of Adam to Noah. It was always the plan. John 1.1, 1, 1. so now a New Testament, Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Genesis 1.1 In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The In the beginning there is there's something before the first thing. The causer of the first cause. John 1.1 1, 1, The same in the beginning Different language. In the beginning was the Word. 
in the beginning was the Logos, this energized idea, this person, this personality, this entity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Kind of this interesting thing going on. In fact, we get the Old Testament version, Elohim, which is plural for gods. But Elohim is also the singular name for God. And is constantly treated as singular, even though the word itself is plural. And a specific plural that means three or more. And then we have the word. And the word that was with God and the word that was God, we have another plural. How many gods do we have? Just one. But somehow the one God is Elohim. And here the word was God and was with God. Verse 14, first half. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word became flesh. The Word that was with God became flesh. The Word that was God became flesh. The Word that was in the beginning became flesh. In the beginning, God in the beginning was the Word. Kind of tells us what's going on here. How did Jesus show up? What was unique about his birth at Christmas? What was unique about his mother, the Virgin Mary, a woman who gave birth to a son without a human man, the seed of the woman? And the gracious God had come down. We already knew. We knew since the first handful of chapters in Genesis that this was coming. God. He was born of a virgin so that he would be the seed of a woman. It was him. The gracious God had come down. Why would he be here? We already know he would be teaching. What would he be teaching that his death will bring comfort? What's going to happen to him? He's the teacher of man. And we know that he is going to be appointed mortal sorrow. From the moment he's born, we know he's appointed mortal sorrow. The wise men knew. They brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is a traditional gift of a king. Frankincense, the traditional gift of a priest. And myrrh, the burial spice. They knew. The Magi from the East knew. These Persian wise men, they seemed to have some idea what was going on. Quite likely, they were from the order of the Magi once led by Daniel, which may be how they knew how they knew what to look for, how they knew when to be looking, how they knew that what they were after was the king of the Jews, and why he was so important it was worth launching an expedition for them to come see this child. Christmas kicked off the plan. He was here. Christmas kicked off the plan. He was here. He would be teaching. He would be afflicted. He would die. And his death would bring comfort. The whole story was laid out by the time Noah was born. By the time Noah was born, the story was laid out. Hundreds of years before the flood. Hundreds of years before an ark was conceived of by a mortal mind and any of that work began. 
the story was all laid out for us. And when Methuselah died, and Noah went on to survive the flood, now the story was told a second time. The story was repeated, and we knew the story. We were told twice. And we can see 14 verses in the John that that's what's happening. Jesus was on a mission. Jesus was on a mission from that first Christmas day. He was born for this. He was on a mission toward that first Easter. That very first Christmas, that baby born in a manger was born to a mission. And that mission was even being recognized before he was born. But his cousin, while Jesus was even still in the womb, responded with joy as to what was coming. The mission. Everything that would happen is part of the mission. Everything that would happen we've known since before the flood. All of it was laid out for us twice. And the gracious God came down. He came down as one of us. He was born as one of us to be appointed mortality, to be appointed mortal sorrow, to be teaching, to teach us that his death will bring the afflicted comfort, coming to be afflicted and to die so that his death would bring comfort. Easter was the plan all along. Easter was the plan in the beginning. Easter was the plan when God made Adam. And God told us the plan right at the start. Everything that would happen from his arrest to his torture to his suffering on the cross, all of it was the plan. And it was the plan from the very beginning. And every step Jesus made in those last hours was completely intentional. At any moment, he could have made it stop. But he didn't. Today is Palm Sunday. We call it the, the triumphal entry. It's the day when the people of Jerusalem were laying down palm branches in front of him as he came in on a donkey. Riding in on a donkey's colt. So I mean this time he set it up himself. He said, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He knows they want to kill him. And he doesn't just sneak into town like a reasonable person with a price on his head. He announces to his enemies, I'm here. Let's do this. At any moment, he could have made it stop. At any number of places, he could have just avoided the whole thing. Except for one important thing. It was always the plan. 